Hi, um, I'm Eric Goldberg, and I'm, it's my privilege to serve as a member of the Programs Advisory Board. And I've been, I've been in the uh, games field for 35 years, first as a designer, and then more recently <coughs> as an advisor and board member to early stage companies. But you're not here to hear, uh, hear about me, you're here to hear from Klaus, who Klaus is the <coughs> co-founder with Alex Versner of GameForge, uh, which was, uh, which is the leading European browser-based game company, and it was for many, for many years, and more recently has gone on to be the CEO of Flare Games, which is, which is aiming to be the first, uh, or at least the most successful, global mobile game publisher. And what we're going to do is ask Klaus to prove this statement, especially to those of you who are developers and publishers who've been in the, been in the space. So let's go through the history of. Mobile game publishing, mobile game publishing, which has been a fairly dismal one. In mobile game 1.0, where we went through in the days of J2Me and Brew, where things went through the carriers or the, or as you Europeans call them, the operators, publishers did not really exist because the operators only gave so many slots on their decks, so they would not give slots to to people, uh, to anyone who was not their own stuff because it was a precious commodity and it gave them. It gave them access. Then, when the smartphone era started, first what happened is, so a couple of developers were extremely successful during the paper download era. For example, Temple Run was, uh, was, uh, was extremely successful, and a bunch of uh, publishers called them and said, we're ready to publish you. And they said, why do we need you? We're doing perfectly fine. We're making money hand over fist. What do we need you for? Then, um, in the, in, and from then until at least last year, people have been able to, if they get a successful game, they're able to go high up the charts. Now there's a bit of a change in that it is becoming a hell of a lot more expensive to be able to do well in the deck. <coughs> Two changes have occurred. One is that the top 10 has ossified. In the last three years, there have not been many changes. And the other, which always happens in every games field, is that, um, is that the cost of producing and marketing the products are greater. But in any event, most developers like to think they can do, their, do it on their own. So Klaus, can you give three reasons why a developer should consider giving over their precious game and a large percentage of the uh, revenues to a, a publisher? Um, yeah, sure, of course. Um, hi, everyone. Um, the the thing about developers is they are really, really great at one thing, and that is developing great quality games that are fun, that are engaging, that are loved by the audience. The skills that developers usually lack is the right positioning, the right marketing, uh, funding to some extent, and then uh, live operations. All of these are necessary for a successful title, and I'm not necessarily speaking like top 10, because you can have a uh, two-digit, three-digit uh, multiple lifetime revenue without even entering those once. Um, so you don't have to aim for the top ten necessarily. But um, what uh, a publishing organization allows a developer is to focus on the things that they are really, really good at and get the leverage from a publishing organization to help them be better at the rest. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with the basic number. Give us the rough cut you will take of the revenues in return for doing publishing privilege. We are not thinking revenues at all. Um, so the deal that we have with all our developers is uh, focused on aligning interest, and on, that's on the lifetime of the whole product. So we are thinking uh, lifetime profit, and this one is shared 50-50. So the basic qu question from a developer's perspective is, can an engagement with Flare Games or another publisher more than double what they can make? And if the answer is yes, the deal is good. All right, well, that also depends on what you count for the profit. So what do you take off the top? Marketing expenses? Everything. Everything that is invested in the game is an invest in the game and is a cost on the P&L. Everything that is earned is an income. OK. That includes the developer's life team, by the way. So in other words, if a developer were to develop the game before they came to you, you would allow them to deduct their costs for developing the game from, from that? It's a it's depending on the deal and the game and the terms and a lot of things. It's negotiable. Right. By the way, any of you, I'm trying to negotiate for you to get ahead on this particular <laughs> point. Yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm paying for beer afterwards. <laughs> 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 right that has to be a lot of beer. Okay. So let's break through. Let's break down why uh, why you're worth that 50% of the lifetime remainder. First, <coughs> marketing. That should be fairly straightforward. But 
what are you going tell tell people what you're going to contribute that a developer might not choose to contribute or can't contribute in marketing? Uh, let's let's pick a concrete example, and that's our latest release, Nonstop Night. Um, it was from Coppola Games from Finland, and they had a real rough diamond there. The short-term retention uh, retention was outstanding. Uh, Long-term retention was meh. Monetization was not really that good. Um, what we did had three main aspects. The first one was marketing and customer focused. So we did uh, uh, consolidated segment testing and really saw what kind of audience interacted best with the product. And the only thing we are looking at there is the retention and engagement and session times. Um, then we tailored all the assets to sell the game, to position the game in the App Store, uh, to present it to users for exactly that audience. So that we are okay. Give some specifics about what assets you position. So, did you change the graphics of the game? Did you? We, so, starting from the first banner, banner that a user sees, the claims, the texts in the app stores, the screenshots, the videos, the icon, even the name, um, and uh, even stretching further because based on the data that we collected and uh, panel tests as well as a B test, we even exchanged the character in the game because we saw that. The core audience interacting with the game was a core role-playing audience, so think Diablo, World of Warcraft, those kind of guys. Um, and the character that was in the game before was not iconic enough, so we created, driven by our marketing department, together with the developer, a character that resonates better with the audience. And uh, as a result of all of these things that we did, we more than doubled the App Store conversion, uh, conversion basically putting CPIs down by more than 50%. And um, in terms of spending money, I s obviously you presumably put up marketing dollars against it. Of course. Uh, and um, can you uh, give us an estimate of uh, how much more efficient, because of your knowledge base, you think you were spending on those marketing dollars? Can you measure that? Of course we can. Uh, three to four times as efficient, I would say. Um, that's both from the efforts of our positioning and, and changing of the games and the funnels. And on top of that, the changes that we did in feature set, roadmap, and the whole performance of the game. So we usually run like a few hundred A-B tests in soft launch periods, uh, really tuning the games in in detail uh, to really figure out what are the best moments to bring in new features, offers, events, whatever. So we roughly quadrupled the monetization of the game, and we roughly halved the CPIs. OK. so. You go and you go and actually poke in the game. Presumably, obviously, you have to get the developers buy-in too, because you're not just saying you have to make these changes or we're not taking you on. Or do you? you no, I mean that would be stupid. Um, the developer always should stay in creative control of the game. Um, while some publishers know a lot about games, and I would count us in this group. Um, we will never feel the same love, and we will never be able to create this kind of magic that is just needed to create a wonderful product. Um, and so the developer has to stay in creative control. Our job is to supply him with data, with insights, with experiences, to enable him to make smarter decisions and support him with dedicated staff in the disciplines where the development team is not strong enough. OK, so let's go. In terms of what you're willing to, uh, are, presumably you're willing to give some assistance with the platforms. Of course. So all right, so I'm an outside developer. By the way, you bought the Nonstop Nights developers, so they're wholly owned by the company now, correct? Now they are owned, yeah. OK, so, um, so this may not be a good example. for People cannot research this, because of course, since you bought it, you don't have the independent speaker anymore. Fair enough. Can you choose another? Can you choose another company, a developer that you haven't bought? The thing is, we usually try to buy the developers we are successful with. Um, so, unfortunately, not because we ended up buying all of them. So, should I? Should by the way, any of you tell me what terms you want me to ask for Klaus by putting it in front of him over here? <laughs> so, so, but are you willing to consider a deal where you where you work with a developer? they do well and you don't buy them? Are you willing to consider that? We will always try. I mean, it, it is not in the deal. Basically, what, what made the developer uh, join our team is, and, and that's in all the cases, the, the, the case that they loved working with us. They saw that we were together stronger than both of us individually, um, and that we were able to make a good offer. OK, so let's go back to, let's go back to a fairly c uh, common uh, publisher, third-party uh, developer conflict. So you bought the Nonstop Nights developer. 
you're of course going to, but everyone, you know, the other two that you have in the pipeline, are of course, are going to be overwhelmed by how wonderful it is to take to, to join forces with you. I'm now the fourth developer. Why should I not believe that you're going to favor the the developers, the titles from the developers that you own over my titles? Which is a conflict that goes back to Electronic Arts and Electronic Arts publishers. It does, and it is a typical publishing developer conflict. Um, the only reason, uh, or the, the only thing that, that we care about is achieve the maximum success for the company. And yes, we have our own studios, and we believe in them, but we treat all of them, and that excludes third-party studios as well our, as our first-party studios, the same way. Same proof points, same processes, everything is exactly the same. And that's on purpose, because we find to, want to find the best titles. And it might be the case that a known studio doesn't get our publishing resources, or we don't want to publish their game. And then we have to figure out. It didn't happen so far. We acquired fairly good teams, so everything that f fell out of there was something that was worth it. But it will happen sooner or later, and then we will just not publish that game, and they will start something else. OK, so let's choose a case where you have to do a tactical loss. So the nonstop night developer does his next game, and then publisher, uh, developer number four comes out with their game, and it does 50% better. So um, the game produces 50% you know, more revenues, but you get more of the profits from the Nonstop Nights game because you own it. Yeah, but um, that's, I mean, of course profits are important to us, but what is more important is scale. And when the game is 50% more successful, it allows us to do more stuff on a, big, on a bigger scale. So that is what we are after. Okay, well, I won't continue on this because it's down to have you stopped beating your wife yet. <laughs> right. But it does bring something else. Let's talk about the other thing that is among the lies that publishers often tell people, which is about cross-promotion, which has been something that has been going on in the, in the modern F2P field ever since UC Laconan and Amplifier tried to put together the Rebel Alliance. Mm -hmm. So talk to us, giving us numbers if you can, about how you get cross-promotion benefits, including from that game from the fourth developer that's doing better than your own title. Just can you, I, I, I want to give an example of the, the, net, the net benefits that you can see that you deliver. I mean, we, we do have a decent portfolio of games and we acquire users for all of them. Um, what portfolio effects and cross-promotion is one, one of the big ones allow us to uh, buy users for all of our games more profitably. From the cohorts that we get into our games, we usually are able to cross-promote 10 to 15% to other games in our portfolio, and then another 2 to 3% in the third game, et cetera, et cetera. What that, is, what that allows us for is spend more aggressively on UA, scale it, because we see portfolio effects for every game from every game. What we actually saw is that adding a game to our portfolio increases the P&L of every game that we have, um, and that is great. So when you say 10 to 15 percent and then 2 to 3 percent, is that downloads or is that actually conversion? Um, that is uh, download conversion. Uh, in terms of quality or monetization, um, it's <laughs> even cooler because the users that we actively cross-promote to other games usually perform five to six times better, and that is without cannibalization in the original game. Okay, so what about benefits on operations? So again, we're looking at what are you able to bring to the party that works because you're able to do this across different games? So a developer comes to you, what benefits are you able to give them on the operations side? Uh, we have our homemade publishing platform that has some third-party solutions integrated as well as the stuff that we build on our own that basically allows us to do all the stuff that we need to do to really tailor the experience for users. So it starts with smart segmenting and prediction algorithms uh, combined with cross-promotion algorithms, A-B testing, um, all the stuff that you just need to run games as a service. Um, and elaborating on that, this is essential to really run games in live operations on scale and something that a developer as such never could build because it just doesn't amortize for one or two games. It's something that we invested millions in because we plan to launch several games. Um, and on scale and with portfolio effect, it makes sense. It's a good investment for us and developers working with us can reap the benefits. Okay, what about community and other, and other things in terms of being able to follow the users elsewhere about you know promoting to let's say Twitch and to other services and so on. What sort of stuff do you do on that? Are you still developing that capability? Um, we are across the board. So we do social stuff, we do community management, we have forums, we do support. Um, we have it all in place. I'm not saying that we are great in everything. Um, 
we are good at everything, and we are striving to be great at everything, and we will be there in a few years, I guess. Okay. So, by the way, for those of you, uh, for those of you, can you please check back with us on February February seventh, two thousand and twenty, and see how Klaus is doing in terms of great challenge accepted. Right. And so on. Well, you got two years and, and 364 days before you feel nervous. <laughs> so, all right. So, in terms of community, uh, just can you talk briefly to about what you do about? Do you allow? Do you allow developers? Will you be allowing developers to choose who they allow in from other from other people? So, for example, do you allow nonstop nights players to t interact with the? the community from, uh, from game number four. I mean, what sort of ways are you going to handle that? Um, we handle community right now on a by-game basis. Uh, players identify with individual games and not with publisher brands. It's not, it never has been the case. Correct. Um, Correct. With very, very few exceptions. So Blizzard, for example, but even, even Blizzard players are engaged with the game and they are fanboys of the game and they want to be in the community of the game. Um, and so the communities are separated. When, games, uh, when players move over to other games, they enter the other community. All right. Now let's talk about the global aspect. So uh, there's been an awful lot of coverage about how hard it has been to crack China as a market, uh, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you've had some traction over there. Do you want to give, uh, you want to give some numbers and give some idea? Sure. Um, so uh, Nonstop Night in China is actually our best geography by far. Um, roughly 50% of our revenue comes from China iOS. Um, what was surprising to us, I mean, we knew that this idle gameplay that Nonstop Night has really figured out well um, is attractive to Asians in general. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a long lasting trend. Um, but uh, the magnitude of the scale surprised us because it was our really big success in, in Asia in general. And the other thing uh, is that the monetization of Nonstop Night is relying on incentivized video ads as well. So that's roughly 50% of our revenues. And the CPMs that we get in China for our inventory are actually on par or even higher than in the US, uh, which really surprised us. OK, so what about the rest of your portfolio in China? Uh, in China? You know, or in, just in Asia, compared to the rest of the world versus Asia? They are doing all right. Um, so geograph geographically, it's roughly 40% uh, China, I would say 60% Western. For your whole portfolio. Oh, well, yeah. So is it a matter of, uh, again, another have you stopped beating your wife yet? Is this a matter of that, since China tends to do poorly per capita, is this a matter of that you're doing poorly in the rest of, so poorly in the rest of the world or you're doing so well in China? Um, China iOS users are not doing poorly per capita. Uh, mm -hmm. What we see is that they are heavier monetizing and more engaged than U.S. audiences. Okay. Oh, really? I, I, on a comparison to the U.S.? Okay, yeah. so the richest world. Talk briefly about China Android. A mess. Um, mm. China Android is hard. You need a partner. Um, and um, it's just difficult. And the regulations that are coming up again and again doesn't make it, don't make it easier. Um, the platforms, it's, it's a very fragmented market. Google Play is not there yet, and I hopefully, uh, ho I hope this will change. Toby, are you here? You are. <laughs> <laughs> um, someday, maybe. Um, so it's a challenge. So who do you work with? People like the Chihus of the world, or um, we have we've tried working with uh, with several publishers. We are still waiting for the launch of uh, Dawn of Steel. That is with NetEase. Mm -hmm. uh, we will see how that goes. Okay, so in other words, you know that that, that happens. And do you believe that there is a, any threat in terms of the iOS gravy train being cut, being cut off? The regulations are coming thick and fast. Uh, they are, and funny enough, uh, as we found out after, after doing it, because China regulations are not that transparent from the outside, is that actually when you apply for a license for the Android version, this license is, uh, is yours for the iOS version as well. So sh suddenly you have to apply to all the regulations that China has for the Android market, even if you had the game before on iOS. Um, it was not a heavyweight thing, fortunately, but um, it came surprising. But we figured it out. Okay, so obviously if a global mobile publisher is going to be a thing, a sustainable thing, you have to have competitors because anything that's successful will have other players. So can you talk positively about some of, about some of your competitors? Uh, sure, of course I can. Um, competitors, um, I, I really see two. 
Um, one is Tilting Point. Um, they are based in New York, and they, from a frame set of beliefs, think similar about things than we do. So um, the, the philosophy is, is similar. Um, with uh, regards to the other one, that's Scopely. Um, Scopely approaches game development, funnily enough, completely different than we do. While we look for, for great developers who have great ideas, innovative things, uh, stuff that really yeah, is innovative and fun and great and high production quality and where we can really contribute, they uh, produce games like movies because they are coming from the movie business. Jesus. So they get a franchise, they find some game or developer somewhere and merge it all together and direct the whole process. It's more a director's job, actually. Well, they also, since I asked you to say only nice things, I will say something that's not so nice, which is that they also try and reverse engineer for the highest, star, the highest chart position. So it makes, it makes something where the developer's goals do not, not they, they look to push changes on it in a way that you say that, that um, Flair does not do. Let's talk about other, another you set of- You said that. Yeah, I know. Uh, let's talk about another set of competitors, which is the people who are not pure play, like Nexon, like NCSoft, and so on and so forth. They have generally, to make sure they get the right titles, they have often invested in the company, and so on and, and, so, on and so forth. If you prove your model, why will they not be able to become, why will they not present a set of 10 to 15 to 20 competitors? Well because it's a really complicated business and the Western markets are different from the Eastern markets as several Asian publishers painfully experienced. I mean, the successes are rare, the success ratio is low, and the way of working together with a developer and investing in them at the same time is not for every developer. Right, and it also means that you're buying into the title beforehand. Yeah. I will say that we will have a panel tomorrow of, Western, of Asian publishers who went into the West, did not do well, but then have come back and done well. And they include, they include Nexon and anyway, of and NCSoft and Greek. Anyway, one other, one other question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. You made the assertion that platforms do want publishers, they just don't know it yet. And since you have at least one platform representative in the audience, <laughs> why, why, why don't you enlighten them along with the rest of the audience? What, what publishers allow for is uh, a good filter function for the right content that people engage with for the long term and that really spice the, uh, the business model of the game as well. In the end, it's a profit center for the platforms and games that do well for the long term is something that they are highly interested in. Okay, and does that mean that publishers are part of it or do you see them completely, the publishers becoming a complete intermediary as happened with the operators? I don't see it to happen completely. There will always be like indie studios or even mid-sized studios that have decent successes and are able to float this, even in the competitive landscape that we have that gets more competitive every day. They will always exist and that's a good thing. But uh, for some developers, the publisher is a really great choice. And for the platforms in general, it makes scouting for the right titles to support um, much easier. Okay, so let's assume that you have so persuaded all the platforms with your words over here that they go on. Are you going to take on some of their gating functions, like making sure that you see the game and prototype three months in advance and so on and so forth? Um, That's what we do, it's our business. But, but you're also going to try, you would presumably want to reverse integrate with the, with the uh, platforms for what they do. Because, I mean, in other words, they do an entire internal check process. And what you're saying, are you going to become someone who replaces that activity, or are you going to reverse engineer into the things where they have to go and light up various things within the platform to be able to launch a game? No, it's, it's a different thing. I mean, uh, we do what we do to find the right games, make them perform, and deliver something on quality that engages users, and this is a great business model for everybody who is participating. Uh, platforms have a curatory thing as well. Um, and that is something that we can't and won't want, to, uh, want to take away from them. No, thanks. I just wanted to see where you cut off the line. So essentially you're delivering the product. I'm curious what the contract says about IP ownership and derivative titles. If uh, somebody has a knockout hit and then developer wants to do a V2 version, who owns that and uh, how do you negotiate that? Um, it depends um, on how much we have to fund, how late we enter the development or how early we come in. Um, obviously and surprisingly, we try to go for IP ownership because we want to build franchises. What we want to make sure though is if we do that, that the developer always has a chance to participate because he created the original franchise. So what we have in that case is always a right of first refusal for the developer to do the sequels. 
So to follow up the question, do you require the developer to give you the, the right of first refusal on their second game if it does well? Usually we try to get the IP and give the developer a right of first refusal, <laughs> but um, since we will be investing heavily in the IP and we help building it, of course we want a right of first refusal in future titles if we don't have the IP in the first place. Okay, I've been beating up Klaus too much. You're going to have to negotiate against him for this <laughs> clause. All right. We answered all of them. Uh, I, I'd say you did a complete presentation. Thank you very much.